I am really pleased to announce that we have two nominees joining us this evening for our leading actor session, Benedict Cumberbatch for The Power of the Dog and Stephen Graham for Boiling Point. Welcome. Um, Thank you. First, yes. first of all, congratulations um, on your nominations and um, both these films are astonishing. Um, I think I'm just gonna jump straight in. Um, both of these men, Phil Burbank and Andy Jones, are lost in a way in their masculinity. Um, they're both in great pain and we meet them at a point in their life where they're not being able to fulfill or live the lives they want to live. So I wanna know as actors how, um, what it's like jumping in at that point in someone's life. Um, maybe Benedict, I'll come to you first, kind of jumping in at the height in time. Thank you. Um... It's a transitional moment in, in this character's existence. Everything that he's kind of built over 25 years that he's wanting to celebrate in the opening of the film is being challenged by a brother who's looking to a future rather than the past. Um, uh, a partnership that comes out of his brother doing that, a, a love for a woman. And it, 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 it is, it is that, literally that point of change, um, which is the sort of key ingredient for the conflict, both within him, but also the, the, the conflict he causes. Uh, within the main quartet of characters, uh, Rose, uh, this barkeep in town that his brother George falls in love with and her son, Peter. And I think, I don't know, I, I, I imagine Stephen might feel the same about this, but I feel, you know, you, you've got to jump in in the middle with any character you play. With, I, I'm, well, I'm 45, I can't remember how old you are, Donnie. You look a lot younger than me, but... Um, it's you, you have to bring some life experience uh, and lived life to a character no matter where a story begins. So I think from that, you then build an empathy and an understanding for why the action and the trajectory of decisions and choices and everything that then unfolds within that two hour story span, which in our case is a linear narrative happens. And it's all the work you do on the person that you don't meet off screen before um, the first page of the novel or the script, that that's the stuff that um, kind of you want to you want to bring as, as the subtext or just a knowledge of that character. So it always feels like you're jumping in in the middle. And um, yeah, I, I, I think you see enough in Phil's um, example of a man who you see him, you know, straining to have something like normalcy something like the routine or what is expected to happen in that moment he's a very controlling character so you realize through his petulance that things not being uh, under his control and circumstances being different to what he'd imagined them or wanted them to be that there's something deeply damaged about this um, volatile um, angry man um, something that's not being satisfied um, so, and, and I think that then speaks to why he is so petulant and, and that kind of emotional immaturity, that stunted growth that's at the center of him. Um, yeah, you begin, um, you begin, you, you, you load what I did, you load the man in a way to begin with. Um, and as the film unfolds, you kind of catch yourself between loathing and empathy. And it's that kind of really fine balance going between the two and kind of, and, and as kind of, as the narrative unfolds, you realize kind of, this trauma that he suffered. And that's similar, Stephen, for Andy as well. They're kind of, both these men are coming from a place of trauma um, that's kind of had a direct impact in a way on their masculinity. Um, and so Stephen, I just want to talk about the notion of kind of um, masculinity and being a man. When, you, when we meet Andy, he's going through a crisis of kind of addiction through Louis, his family breaking up, not living with his son. And so the same as, in the way that I asked Benedict, just what is it coming coming into a role at that point? Um, I, I completely agree with Benedict. You know, a lot of the work as actors we've done before that. I mean, I am a little bit older than you. I'm, I'm 48. Um, okay. so, so, uh, so, you know, you've done a lot of that work previously, and especially with, particularly with this story, as soon as we, we meet Andy, he's already saying sorry. He's already mm. apologising. Which I think was very, you know, that was that was a really clever decision that we made straight away. As soon as we meet him and we're with him on this journey for an hour and 10, 15, 20 minutes, immediately starting off by saying sorry. And it's also it, it just shows you completely where he's at as as a as a man, do you know what I mean? And then we go on this journey with him. But like Benedict said, a lot of that stuff is done 
it's the stuff we do in the house or it's the stuff we do in our downtime. I've always got a little pad or something with me when I'm, I'm getting into a character and you just jot stuff down, information down. And it goes from, you know, basically that kind of Stanislavski stuff, but you're creating a whole life about where he was born, what, what, what school he went to, what his mom and dad was like. And you build this kind of, yeah, you build a, a backstory that you can, you can then go anywhere with in that respect. And what that enables me to do personally is to just stand in the truth of the character that I've created with the director as well, do you know what I mean? And with the rest of the cast, but also it gives you freedom then to play, I feel personally, because then there's no real right or wrong. You're just experimenting and seeing what's happening. Then you can pluck an idea from, you can pluck an idea from one of the sparks, do you know what I mean? It's, it's whatever idea is the best idea in the room. And that way you don't take it personally and, and you, you're solid within that character and that structure that we've, that conscript of the character that we've created. Um, and for this particular story, it, it's in the title, it's a man at a boiling point, everything's just collapsed, everything's falling away from what he's had, do you know what I mean? You can see he must have had a good life, he's, he has been successful, but now because of his, his, his addiction and his demons and his own fear and self-loathing, it's just slowly falling away from him. Um, and you get to see, in that sense, the masculinity, it's... I suppose you see, I had, I had a I had a backstory where it was kind of issues with his father and stuff. So mm. it's him trying not to be what his father was, but his father was an alcoholic. So for him, it's it's always been a part of his DNA. It's been there since he was a young boy. Um, and to watch that kind of the upbringing that he must have had, and he's trying his hardest not to be like that with his son, and then eventually you end up creating the same mistakes that you've seen. Do you know what I mean? That kind of indoctrinated background that he's come from. But then it's just, as soon as it's, as soon as we begin with this film as well, it was, you know, it was 90% improvised um, over the process. So everybody else is, is on that same page as me with the created character that we've all got. And then you just throw it all up in the air and, and we play, we have the structure of it. Like, you know, like what Benedict said, it, it's the story, it's the structure that's within that story. Mm -hmm. But then we all improvise and, and then you're just one big moving machine, I suppose, in a way, you know what I mean? I think I, you, you sound like you had a, a, a tougher gig in the sense, but I mean, uh, very enjoyable to, to, to create that from scratch. I was working off this incredible blueprint of a book. So within that, though, there are massive amounts of flashbacks and incredible insights into who this character was as a child how his parents taught, treated him and what they expected of him and the kind of pressure of conformity that was there very early in his life that he pushes against again and again in in the film and uh, and makes him the person we meet in the beginning frames of it and i think it's it, it, it's I, all the kind of notepad work well a lot of it was done was done through that there's a there's one key relationship with his real father figure um, which you're talking about your dad made me, um, your character's dad made me think of, which is Bronco Henry. And that's really a pivotal, pivotal relationship in this man's life. Someone he was in love with and had a relationship with, as well as him being his mentor and tutor, but huge age gap. And he was 19 when he saw him trampled to death in a corral. So that for me kind of keyed into that sense of arrested development um, that results in this, this sort of, this anger in this man, this masculinity, this need to prove himself as something other than this true, I guess, um, authentic self, which is a man who's loved another man and doesn't know where to place that in the world and the time he lives in and the culture he's in, um, but also within himself and his own body. He can only really associate that with something that's very deep and private in moments in the film where he's away from everybody else. Um, but I mean, what a gift, what a gift. Thomas Savage's novel, I mean, it's one of the great American novels, in my opinion. I mean, it's just one of those books where you get, you know, a character in a phrase, an entire world in a page. It's just, it's majestic writing, beautiful, um, very accessible, but really scalpel-like about character and time and place. So a, a lot of my heavy lifting was done with that, but Bronco's very lightly touched on. So we had to improvise him and I wrote letters to him from me and also as him back to Phil um, in the time that they were lovers and to try and make that somehow feel authentic. And like, like Stephen says, 
it, for me, it's a jumping off point to feel free within the process of the day so that whatever you're committing to, it's the same with learning lines and just getting all that done. You, you kind of, once that's there, it's then about just letting things be free. And all of it, all the work you do before stepping in front of a camera for me is about feeling confident in my intuition so that I know I can feel feel something and let something come through rather than getting in the way of it and managing it too much and intellectualizing it just to actually breathe it and and you said you know working with others for me I've never worked in parallel with the director so kind of closely and for a long period of time I mean this I usually kind of you know make the plane as it's taking off but this one I had a few months other things going on but of continual communication with Jane and whether it was going around the National Portrait Gallery looking for just something to trigger a visual clue or a sense of the world or one character or an aspect of the era, um, or whether it was just getting to know one another as people who were trusting each other to work together. Um, and also just conversationally, but we did dream therapy. We did Jungian dream analysis, which is a real trip. The idea that you can just drop a tiny suggestion on a notepad or in a mantra or some kind of thought process before you sleep and then let your subconscious do some of that work so as if having a book wasn't easy enough I, I then <laughs> fell back on dreaming for for inspiration but boy is it there after the first few dry spells of worrying about whether I you know in the dream I thought oh Christ did I lock the door or is the oven on and Jane was dreaming of flowers exploding with blood um I exaggerate but not far off and uh, and then eventually <laughs> you know, that silt from the bottom of the well kind of gets a little bit more interesting and stuff comes up, which I never would have thought of looking there for before. So that was a very new experience for me. Um, you've kind of touched on so many things there. I wanted to go back to the... Yeah, sorry. Thomas. No, 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 it's great. Um, the Thomas Savage novel and kind of that being, um, you know, a more than like your Bible, more than a jump off point, but how much of the physicality of Phil Burbank's in that? Because it's like, it's a you for me, I've never seen before in terms of kind of the stance and the hand and the walk and banjo playing and cigarette, right? It's just, but it seemed that so effortlessly, it's like you've been doing it for your entire life, but how, yes. yeah, how much of that is kind of from the book? How much of that is working with Jane? Um it's there's a lot of guide in the book you know he stands with his hands uh, held behind his back spraddle legged his sort of poise his animation and how characterful he can be in entertaining people what a good mimic he is um and of course recounting this really daunting list of masterful skills he can uh, um, you know, do with the ease of a man who's been doing it for all of his life, whether it's whittling or whistling or braiding or taxidermy or ironmongery or banjo playing. I mean, it just goes on and on, let alone the horse riding and the roping and the <laughs> and the cattle ranching. It's uh, pretty daunting for, for, for a man as far away from my character's lived experience as I was at the beginning. But, you know, Jane and Tanya and everyone in the production were very secure that I get there, but said, look, anything you feel insecure about, will help you with and so I gave them the list which was endless and uh, I went to a place in Montana I went to stay with uh, the real deal uh, a man and his wife Randy and uh, Jen who live on the prairie not far from the sort of Rocky Mountains and I learned to braid I learned to treat hide I learned to cut it and bevel it and just get it straight and soak it and stretch it and then braid it and he's a master at that he's a master and he's asked for rope all around the world from all around the world he also flies around the world doing horse clinics uh, so he's a masterful rider and he's lived the life of a cowboy his entire existence so that was an amazing person to be with and then I went off to two different ranches to, to to two branding events where you brand inoculate and castrate the cattle and I, you know, I, I had to, I, just I, just a regular day at work. Yeah, Thank you. Were, yeah. I mean, it, I mean, God, what, what a what a life! Yeah. <laughs> so, so lucky. When would I've had that opportunity? Otherwise, all the excuse to just turn around to my wife and family and go, um, "See, yeah, I'm going, I'm going away for two weeks." <laughs> yeah. That would be a divorce situation, but it's work. Love. It's I'm yeah. I'm going to work. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I was super yeah. lucky, but um, I, yeah, and I mean, I, it it. it I bless you for what you said about how accomplished I, I, I looked or got away with looking at it. It's, it's a pretty terrifying thing because again, that's the stuff that it has to be in your body and it has to, there has to be a sense memory and a muscle memory behind it. But you, you also have to let go and stop obsessing about the fact that you've just rolled 
a really fat one instead of a rail thin cigarette <laughs> one hand whilst you're riding a horse and that the light was right the horse was right the dialogue was good the other actor was good and however many hundred or thousands of cattle you've got behind you were good so the fact that you didn't run <laughs> cigarette well you've got to let that go um but knowing that you're playing phil burbank and, and doing that's pretty tough um so i think it a lot of it is helped by you know framing it in a certain way and i don't mean cheating it but just giving it space when it needed space and not focusing on his skill set when it wasn't it wasn't necessary um but yeah i i it, it, i'm a definitely i've experienced all of those things i'm a master of absolutely none of them <laughs> They will come in handy one day again, I'm sure. Um, um, Talking kind of learn skills on the job and having space to develop those. Um, Stephen, kind of doing a one take film and then head chefing your way through the whole kind of 80 minutes. And hey, the skills kind of kind of to be believable as a chef. But then kind of what were you thinking? Kind of one take (laughs) like this, you know, is it thrilling? Uh, was it kind of, I've never done this or was it because the story really served, you know, having having that method? Well, um, it, it began life as a short, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? We, we began life as a short film and it was basically, if I'm brutally honest, it was to help my mate Phil maybe get an agent. That was the main reason for doing it. Um, he, did a sh- he, did, he did one film and he said, look, I've got a part in this, would you please come and play the, the, the trainer, the boxing trainer? I said, no, 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 go on, you do that one yourself. Let, let me see what that's like, and I'll, 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 I'll have a look down the line. Um, and I thought it was a beautiful little story. And then he told me he had this idea about um, a chef based on, because a lot of our stuff is based on Phil's experience, because Phil was a chef. He was a, a commie chef and a head chef for, for a good number of years, um, while he couldn't get no work as an actor. And he kind of, that, that was the job he then, ended up doing for a long time. So a lot of it is based on his own experiences. Um, and that kind of world, he just really felt that there was a great story to be told in that world because of the kind of nature of what those kitchens are like and the atmosphere that's in them kitchens. And also it's very kind of, you know, I, I'm, I'm not speaking out of turn at all, but it's a kind of work hard, play hard kind of mm-hmm. industry. Um, and it's that very much, you know, everyone's there, everyone's in the fire together. And then at the end of the, the, the service, there's a release amongst everybody. Do you know what I mean? So we wanted to try and capture that atmosphere of, and you said it beautifully before we started this interview, you said you really, you know, you had a few friends that worked in that industry mm. and how, how true to life they thought it was. Yeah. And that's the reaction we've had from a lot of people. So when he first mentioned about doing it for a short, I thought, why that's that's a bit of fun I've never done that before um and it was great because Phil was a chef so he taught me how to you know debone a fish and stuff like that and to cut the meat and to we went to a a huge restaurant where they did a a, they were doing covers of 180 um for an evening and we watched the atmosphere in there and it was manic and then we went to this other place in Manchester and it was like it was beautiful it was a zen (laughs) kitchen everything was methodical and Everyone spoke really quietly and lovely, and it just it, there was no it, there was no franticness at all. It was a beautiful place, and the food was delicious. So I was like, "Well, which one of them are we going to do? You know, we'll find somewhere in the middle, hopefully." So that was our aim. So the, the, sorry. So then it went from the short, and the short went down really well, and he got a really great agent. Um, and then the agent went, "Why don't you think about making a feature?" And then he said to me, "Do you want to make a feature?" Ah, uh, and I thought about it for a split second and then you know I said yeah okay let's go for it um and that was and that was kind of where it started but a lot of it is based on Phil's experiences in the kitchen of people who he worked with or stuff that he'd seen or it, you know he doesn't mind speaking about it his own mm. kind of addictions and stuff that he suffered himself um and the whole kind of bottle with the chef that that's based on a, a real person someone who he worked with that used to do that, you know what I mean? When we find out at the end what's in the bottle, that's that's based on mm. what's that happened to him. So it was great, you know, very much like what Benedict was saying there. He went and met that wonderful man and his wife in, out there in, in the prairies and, and you just absorb that knowledge from them people. So for me to go to Phil, so how do I do this bit again? Just show me. And you watch and you just, 
you're like a sponge, you just absorb it all, do you know what I mean? Because you have it on tap. Um, and then when it comes to it, one of the most important things that I felt we had to get right was was the plating up for the chef. Because it's like I said, it's the chemistry of cooking it. But then when it's plated up, that's the, you know, that's where that makes you a, a, yeah. that's what makes a chef a, a top chef or a not so good chef. And it's the it's it's the placement of the of the meat, of the of the duck and like the, the vegetables and then what you do with your jus and that, that kind of flair of artistry, do you know what I mean? That that it's it was it was great fun doing that kind of stuff. And we even we spent a night in a proper kitchen and we had a little go at that. <laughs> me and Vanette, and then we'd send that to you. And that's, <laughs> it was it was amazing. It was a wonderful experience. Very hard job, but um, yeah, hopefully, you know, we managed to capture all of that kind of research. And, and like like Benedict said, it's great to have somebody there who really knows that world and, and you can you can just pluck the ideas from them as well as yourself, you know what I mean? Is that how you're plating up at home now? <laughs> no, no, it's not. <laughs> not at all. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I won't. Um, I won't ruin it for people at home that might not have had a chance to see boiling point yet. But there is a there's a plating up moment that is terrifying, and you never. I, that's a sentence I thought I would never say. But yeah, watch out for that for that moment. Um, you both mentioned your incredible directors, Jane Campion and Phil Barantini. I wanted to talk about the DOPs on both of these films. If that's yeah. okay. Kind of for Power of the Dog, um, Ari Wagner and Matthew Lewis for yeah. um, Boiling Point. Um, just in terms, kind of with the Power of the Dog, first of all, um, what's captured, kind of, I think it's a, might be emblematic of how Phil's feeling. Kind of, there's this expanse, but at times there's also moments of claustrophobia and terror that, you know, a, a shown through the frame and yeah. then for you for yourself Stephen kind of being that taking you being the heartbeat of the film and then Matthew having to mimic your beat those kind of working together must have been kind of such important relationships for both of you on set and kind of just wanted to talk about kind of yeah the preparation how you know the working relationship is for an actor and a cinematographer especially in these two roles where it seems so imperative um Ari is a child of light. She just has an incredible gift. Um, and while we were in a very spectacular part of New Zealand, um, doubling for Montana because of the kind of 360 degrees of near wilderness, or at least un, un, <sighs> uninterfered with land, let's put it like that. Um, there was a lot of that that was there for nothing but but what was brilliant about her as you alluded to in, in your question was the idea that she could move from one scale to another with such ease and she could dig into a character hold on a shot between her and and peter our editor and jane you know but a shot that she created and found with jane um they they had an amazing language at the beginning and i actually i found i found that a little bit unnerving to begin with because jane and i had had such an intimate sort of preparation for the job and then suddenly there was this other person who was going to be required and you know they'd be over there and i'd be doing this and it's sort of going what are they cooking up between them but you know and so for, for a large majority of the time i guess I, my relationship with ari was just to let her alone and pretend that she wasn't there um and especially on the day because i was in character for the whole of this shoot it she really she said to me she she only really met she was kind of crying at the end of it she said oh my god i'm now hearing you i'm seeing you for the first time yeah. i've not met benedict until now um and she was so sensitive to that and i kind of felt that and i really felt it in the moments where it feels vulnerable and exposing himself not just physically but but psychologically to the kind of truth of his character to to being in that isolated moment and feeling able to perform without any restriction to just find something and knowing that she will in a very, very delicate and sensitive way, an essential way, capture it um, through the interplay of light and weather and me and the, the nature around me, but also the horse and, and just, it was very, very intimate. It was like the three of us um, on set, my, myself, Jane and her. And that, that was sort of a treasured memory in a way because it was just something we all sort of let happen. Um, 
and she was very light on her feet. I noticed a couple of times, you know, a lot of track laid down for a big shot or a crane come in or, and then they just find something much simpler. Go, Why don't we just look at it from kind of over here? It was always about character, but when landscape and scale was involved, it was again about character. It wasn't just to let the film breathe or for you to have an idea of context. It was to understand what that space means for different people, whether it's George who's growing sick of the routine of it, whether it's Phil whose command of it and belonging to it is so primal and, and so much about who he is. He is the outside. He is a man of the soil and the blood and the, and the sweat of, of working with animals uh, and men in that space. Uh, or whether it was Rose, whose alienation becomes even more acute as she, you know, enters this huge ranch and its surrounding countryside. And while well, she's found this intimacy in love with her husband, she's being psychologically tormented by a man who seems to be everywhere, whether it's in the sound of the wind or the hills or a door closing. And I, I was only really well able to marvel at, Ari's achievements when I first saw the film in London a uh, long time after finishing it and then you know I, I, because I had such a sort of singular focus on what I was doing I wasn't producing this one or, or directing or you know, my singular role was just being Phil Burbank uh, which was enough and um, I just sat back and thought I, I was just blown away by what I'm contextualizing as far as her work goes it's just it's exquisite and she picks up just picks up on your rhythms and she knows how to and to really feel your performance in the space and she knows when to be very close and when to retreat and uh, every bit of the language that her and Jane had that I was sort of slightly jealous of to begin with is born out of an intimate understanding and love of the story and you realize when you see the whole thing together how everyone was was pulling in the same direction on this speaking the same language yeah completely. without knowing it <laughs> completely completely I would have loved the material and the characters, you know. Um, so, Steve, you and Matthew must have had to do a dance and a routine and something that kind of, I don't know how much rehearsal and you can have either, like, he can have missed a beat and you can have missed a beat. And it was, um, it was one of the most unique relationships with the DOP I've ever had in my life. Um, and I've been very blessed to work with some magnificent DOPs. But this 24-year-old lad was oh. 22, oh. Alice just made me aware of. No, he's 23, he's 23 now. <laughs> he was well, 22 when we did it. He was absolutely um, amazing. And, and let's not forget, for me, this film, I mean, it's an ensemble very much so in my eyes as well, because you don't only, you know, the, we, we made a conscious decision with the, with the, the feature rather than with the shorts. With the short, we always follow Andy everywhere, everywhere. Andy goes, we go. But with the feature, it was kind of, we would let other people take us on different journeys, which, you know, there's a wonderful, beautiful moment where we go outside with the dishwasher while he goes to meet the girl in the car and then we come back in. There was something about that, which to me, we were in this London kitchen. It was all very hectic and chaotic. And then the film just took, suddenly just took a little twist. And I felt like we were in some French film for a little bit then, do you know what I mean? But when I say it was such a unique relationship is we rehearsed for, uh, we rehearsed the characters and we rehearsed the dialogue and stuff for maybe two days in total. But on top of that, then we spent two days walking through it with the camera. Um, and that would be with Phil, um, would be with Matt. And we walked it through and we'd walk it through slowly, piece by piece by piece by piece. Um, and he'd move around and he'd make sure, because he also never wanted to hit the same kind of shot or rest in the same place twice. So he was completely aware of his, his surroundings and his environment. And then when we came to do like, we call it a dress rehearsal, let's say, it was, if you, you know, because so, sometimes I'd, I'd go off at a different pace and just to, and like Benedict rightly said, you know, our aim is to, forget that the day. Our aim is mm. to forget that the camera even exists. It, it, do, it shouldn't exist. It doesn't exist. Some actors you wait with, it does exist, but that's a different story. <laughs> so the, our aim is to try and pretend it's not there. So that's okay for me. But So when I'm going off, when I'm suddenly going to go, well, I'm going to go over there now. And I'm maybe twice before I've gone over there at a certain pace. And then he feels me coming at another pace. And just to watch and to make, to see how he moves back 
was unbelievable. Um, and he never ever, he, there was once, one, at one point he wrestled the camera. And for the whole time, he's got this device that, you know, them, you've seen them little new devices now that they have, and it goes over the top and they rest yeah. it. It's yeah. And he's got this little camera attached to him. And his back, at the end of every take, we, we had a masseuse for him because his, his back must have killed him. But there was one point, this is kind of how tune we got, how in tune we did get. And it's the actual take because the take was the third shot. We only did four takes. Wow. I knew we'd get it on the third take. I said, I said, <laughs> but we only did four takes because of COVID. We were supposed to, we were scheduled to do eight, but there was one bit where I was waiting as he's, because also as well, don't forget, it's kind of in that weird sense. It's kind of like a play where you're in it, but also there's moments when you're not on camera and you're getting ready to get to another exit or get to another place while the life and the action is carrying on for the audience and, and inside that room. Um, and I had to go out somewhere and then I come back and I'm waiting. And I'm supposed to wait for him to go past me on this little tiny narrow pass. That was the other thing. You know, it was a real restaurant we were working. It was a real kitchen. It wasn't a set that was created. And as he's due to come past me, I suddenly looked and I saw that the bin was in the way. And for a split second, I went, oh no, there's the bin. And then I looked back and then there's Matt coming back. With me. And I just thought, <laughs> Oh, what, what are we going to do? So I grabbed the bin and ran as fast as I could and give the bin to, I think it was, I think it was Alice. Give the bin to Alice. And, we, get the bin, and then ran straight back. And then as, <laughs> as he come, just as he goes past me, I'm like, right, okay, we need to do the thing. And then you're straight back into it again. Do you know what I mean? It was, it was a wonderful thing. And, and it basically was, we, all of the cast did a choreography with my, mm. it, it was a, it was choreographed to a T, really. So then we could play within that structure. You know what I mean? Let's talk the about the rest. I said, let's talk about the rest of that cast as well. Um, watching the film, um, it feels so authentically the London I know, kind of with the kitchen staff, the front of house, the people in the restaurant. It's cast in a way that is so believable. Um, and I know this was. Um, the first production for your own company, Matriarch, as well. So we, how involved were you in that casting process? Uh, heavily, heavily involved in the casting. I wanted, you know, and Phil as well, um, and, and the rest of the rest of our producers. And we, we all wanted to, to make it as real and as authentic as possible. Mm. And, and that was, you know, that was diversity was our key component to that. We all felt, do you know what I mean, massively. Um, and as well with the philosophy of our little production company, it's that to give people an opportunity to try and give someone a chance that wouldn't normally have that chance. For example, Matt, you know, Matt wouldn't have, it's, the, you know, people with money wanted to come in and go, well, maybe we should have. And it's like, no, 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 no. We, this is, this is who's doing it. We need, you know, at some point we all need to be given an opportunity. Otherwise we'll never get that opportunity. We'll, know, we'll never know what we're capable of. So right across the board, the cast and was integral to, 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 was making this as real as possible and also trying to give as many opportunities for people as we could. There's one or two of our cast who, you know, it was only their second job. Yeah. Um, and one of them now is like, she's, she's gone on, she's flying, she's doing a, a huge Netflix series and she's just landed another big feature film and she's flying. Um, but this was only a second, well, a third job because was, she was in the short as well. So it's that, it's that, that's what we really wanted to capture. And we wanted to try and make it as truthful and as authentic as possible. And make it feel like it was a real kitchen. And to have these flavors of, you know, um, our lovely pregnant Spanish woman who's washing the dishes. When I looked, I was like, oh, what? Oh, she, she was really pregnant. Like not just pretend pregnant, she was pregnant in a, she's had the baby now. So that in itself, do you know what I mean? It, it, was, it, it was a wonderful experience. And to me, as Benedict will, will, will rightly back me up in this, you know, I, th I always think casting is key. Yeah. I, think, mm -hmm. I think the casting is key to, to, to making the film a success. Do you know what I mean? If you get the casting wrong at any point, it, it can be drastic. But it's also, about, for us personally, it was about creating opportunities and giving people a chance. Do you know what I mean? Well, that is a perfect segue into one of the questions that has come through asking if, um, talking about up and coming talent, and is there anyone that, you know, people may not have heard of at home that people should be on 
the lookout for. So Benedict, I'll come to you if you can. Yeah. I mean, behind the camera, in front of the camera, you know, either. Sure, sure. Um, I mean, Cody is, as he often says, you know, I've been doing this for all my life. And you think, God, you're you're, you're a baby. (laughs) When I started at his age, you know, um, but he is an extraordinary accomplished actor. He's been working as a child actor for a while, but this feels like a sort of a really important progression for him um, where he's proved his worth in a spectacular way. It's a phenomenal performance. And, and like Steve was saying, casting's key. I mean, you know, Kirsten, obviously, you know, and Jesse, you know, but for me, the first person I thought of as George was Jesse Plemons. And there was a toing and froing to do with dates and another another casting idea. And Jesse thought, oh, I don't know if I've played something like this before. And he can speak to that, obviously. But um, then Kirsten got cast. And I was like, come on, we, we've got to be Jesse. This is just yeah. perfect. Um, and they're so good. They had to obviously undo the language of intimacy they have as a couple um despite there being chemistry you have to you have to learn it afresh for your characters Stephen knows you know he's worked with Hannah his missus and it's a different thing it's very it's very different so there's that but as far as a discovery I, I feel that this is a re- for the world, the world at large a large, a large audience um but you know I am talking about someone who's been in uh you know um uh, the X-Men who's been in, um, <laughs> gosh, what else has he been in? Uh, Let the Right One In was one I remember, right, The Road. Um, you know, he played the kid in The Road. Yeah. So it's just, yeah, he, he's not at the beginning of his career, but um, <laughs> it, it, it's just, it's an amazing moment for him nonetheless. And behind the camera, I mean, we had quite a few very well-established people, but I guess Ari is 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 the youngest of, of those who are established um and people may know her work i guess at BAFTA audience will definitely know her work from from lady macbeth which was just a a masterful piece of cinematography and um together with florence Pugh's performance just to help me spellbound for the whole of that film yeah. um she's very 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 remarkable and again she's done quite a bit since they jane and her actually met on a commercial so they already had a a previous but it is it was the first feature that she's she's done uh, with her and she's she's remarkable. So those would be my two picks. I don't think I, I'm probably I'm well a lot actually a lot of our cowhands as well. There was a first time actor who came all the way from Australia, well, all the way from Australia. We were in New Zealand, but still quite a way. Who was used to working sheep branches out there? Who was amazing. He was just the real deal, and um, he didn't know whether he was going to continue with the acting. He was going back to his day job, but he just was so. It gave us all that buzz, not that we needed it, especially with COVID stopping production. We all got that fresh feeling of quite how unique what we do is and how lucky we are to do it and how not to take any of it for granted because because it was taken away for a while and it looked like the film might be in real peril of not being um, completed. And um, yeah, amongst us, yeah, he was just this, yeah, joyous light. In fact, there were three there were three non actors in our in our company of uh, ranch and uh, ranch men. And somebody told me a long time ago, I'm not allowed to say cowboy anymore, which I find odd because Randy, who is a cowboy, calls himself a cowboy. But anyway, so I always hesitate. <laughs> Ranch hand is, I think, the term I'm supposed to say. But, you know, he, he was, ex- the three of them were extraordinary. And, yeah, I think you'll see a lot of those boys uh, in, in separate fare. Um, but, yeah. Stephen? Um. That's a great question because I could pick any one of them, I think, yeah. personally, do you know what I mean? <laughs> um, especially, we've already spoke about Tom, um, and I think Phil, Matt, Matt, sorry, I called him Tom, Matt, um, yeah. and Phil, definitely. Um, I think Phil Valentini will, I think he's a wonderful director, you know, he really is, he's got such a beautiful temperament and, and his, his manner on set and, and how he treats everybody on set is beautiful. Um, and he's, he, you know, he comes from an experience of being an actor. So he, he has that knowledge and he, he, he really appreciates and respects the process. Um, and there's Lauren, for me, Lauren, I can't think. Anna, what's Lauren's second name? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> How do you pronounce it? Adufo, thank you. See, she knows everything. Lauren Adufo, who, who is magnificent. She's beautiful. I love that, you know, I don't want to spoil it for anyone that hasn't seen it, but you know the moment I mean at the table. Mm-hmm. Um, and the moment yeah. that happens, yeah. and how the camera just stays back and we just see it go through her face. 
And yet it's something, you know, that I know the discussions that her and Phil had about that. And she used a lot of her own personal experiences in those situations as well that she'd lived through. So I think now she, she for me was a standout. They were all, and but I feel bad picking any one particular person because um, it was a beautiful job to do. It was mm. it was the most exciting job I've ever done because of that kind of difference in in in. In, in the ages amongst the, all of us, but also in the experience of us all, do you know what I mean? Some were brand new and you feed off, kind of takes the back me up, like you said, when about that ranch hand, mm -hmm. cowboy mm -hmm. ranch hand. Um, <laughs> you, you know, you watch them and you marvel at them at what they're doing, you go, wow. And, and it excites you again, do you know what I mean? And then and then you just bounce off each other, really. It's, it's To me, it, it, I always use that reference of, and I, gets annoyed because I always bring acting back to football and it's passing the ball to me <laughs> passing the ball you're just passing the ball to each other all the time do you know what I mean yeah. and that's that's the joy of it and with this beautiful cast like I say all different experiences it was just a wonderful wonderful job to be a part of and it, it was the most exhilarating yet the most zen like I've ever had to be and the most zen like I've ever been on a set because you were right in that moment every single time. You couldn't, you were in it, you were captured in that space in time. Without sounding pretentious, that hour and 10 minutes or whatever, we were all on fire for that hour and 10 minutes, every single one of us. The energy in that room was palpable. It, it, was, it was one of the most amazing experiences, apart from getting married and the two people, <laughs> which I have. It was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. It just was. The energy, and, it, it, and I don't want to sound like some weirdo because we went to a spiritual place in there. Mm. Benedict's done beautiful plays and, and he's done Shakespeare and he'll understand what I'm saying in that play context. But to have that context as well in, in a film with that, not wanting to get anything wrong, but then if someone does drop a plate, you drop a plate in a restaurant, don't you? Mm -hmm. So you just carry on, you just go with it. You just let it be a part of the piece. Um, yeah. So in that respect, for me, it was it was beautiful. And I learned so much from these people and these young up and coming actors because I fed off their hunger as well. Do you know what I mean? And I was that I was the oldest, I was the oldest one there, I was the old statesman of it all, but it was a wonderful experience. And and it's unfair for me to pick anyone else because I hope they all flourish in the careers that they have in our profession. And hopefully, hopefully at the bottom of my heart, I mean that. It does really sound for both of you of it kind of both of these films have been completely unique kind of career-wise for both of you and kind of what you've learned about yourself, what you've learned about the craft of acting and then what you're hopefully taking forward kind of in everything you're doing as well. But maybe I'm, maybe I'm overstepping, but, you know, it seems that it's been, yeah, a really oh, special time. Oh, I very much feel that. Very much feel that. Yeah. We have so many questions from the audience at home, okay? So... Um, the first one is from Jessica Romero. Um, the Power of the Dog has been a watershed in your career. Phil is an extraordinary and complex character and shows human vulnerability and emotional dependence behind the rude personality. Could you tell me why you think it's important to portray him in the 21st century? Because, um, because there are many of him still in the world. And I think if we're to teach our sons to be feminists, if we're to teach equality, if we're to understand what poisons the well in men, that what creates toxic masculinity. We need to understand and look under the hood of characters like Phil Burbank to see what their struggle is and why that's there in the first place, because otherwise it will just keep repeating itself. And while we're thankfully moving into a space now where survivors are being heard and supported and protected, um, we've got a way to go on that um, still, uh, don't get me wrong, but. I think we also really have to look at the root cause of the behavior that these people have suffered from. And this man, trying very hard not to say anything about a very odd reaction that happened the other day on a radio podcast over here, and without meaning to sort of stir over the ashes of that, it's, it just, it, it, I won't get into the details of it. If it's, if it's hit the news at home, it has, it has here. Um, but someone really took offense to, um, I haven't heard it, so it's unfair really for me to comment in detail on it, but really took offense to the West being portrayed in this way. Um, and 
beyond that reaction, that sort of denial that anybody could have any other than a, a heteronormative existence um, because of what they do for a living or where they're born, there's also a massive intolerance within the world at large towards homosexuality still, towards um, uh, an acceptance of the other, of any kind of difference. And no more so, I guess, in this prism of conformity in the sense of what is expected of a man in, in the sort of um, the Western archetype mold of masculinity. And so I think to deconstruct that through Phil to sort of look at that, it's not a history lesson. And I mean, need we look much further than what is going on in Russia at the moment to understand that somewhere in the mind boggling idiocy of that man's megalomania is some damage there's some damage there and we saw it in a president of, of the, the country that's hosting me at the moment though you know th these these people are still exist in our world and whether it's on a doorstep or whether it's down the road or whether it's somewhere we meet in a bar or a pub or i don't know um in a sport on the sports field there's there is aggression and anger and frustration and an inability to control or um know who who you are in that moment that causes damage to that person and as we know far far more openly now as i was saying damage to others around them um i think there's no harm in in, in looking at a character to try and get to the root causes of that i mean this is a very specific case of repression um but also due to an intolerance a societal intolerance for for that for that true identity that that, that that Phil is, that Phil has, that he can't fully be. Um, but I think the more we look under the hood of toxic masculinity and try to discover the root causes of it, the, cho the, the bigger the chances we have of, of dealing with it. Um, when it when it arises with our children in, in playgrounds at school, with our friends, in the behavioral patterns that we might see in innocent play mm. and just understand, yeah, how to, how to police that, how to teach, um, something that includes their feelings and holds them in that emotional space so they can be what they are being in that moment but not cause damage to themselves or others that was a long answer yeah, yeah. but do, do you think it is as simple as talking i know that sounds like a really silly thing to say but yeah. and about it for me when i was watching the power yeah, it's, of the very, it's very easy to talk yeah, in yeah, webinar about yeah. films and, and yeah. you know with like-minded yeah. artistic yeah. folk and it's much harder to go up to the guy at the bar who wants to glass you and go hey look um I'm really sorry things haven't worked out for you until <laughs> it's very hard to know how to mediate it within real yeah. life but I think that's one of the great things we get to do as storytellers in, in culture is to be able to siphon it into metaphor to to sort of let it kind of let it let the light you know peek through the crack a little bit and just hopefully it might touch someone or ignite a conversation about it that might reach someone like that. It's, it's much harder to go out and kind of billboard that as a problem because <laughs> of course the, the, the massive aggression and defensiveness you'll meet with that as well as the fist or the, the weapon or whatever it might be. It, yeah. It doesn't necessarily find um, a, a good space and a time to be aired in, in everyday life. And I think that's why art and storytelling of any kind, whether it's a song lyric or um, you know, someone speaking of their own experience, a lived experience, or whether it's a piece of piece of art or poetry or film, could sometimes do that. It can, I really do believe that. Again, without sounding too pretentious, I just, I think that is one of the things that art categorically is socially, societally incredibly important for at every level, at every level, you know? And um, it's why, yeah, it's why I think, you know, both Stephen and I are very passionate about it being something that's introduced to kids at school and that's funded properly and that's something that yeah it's part of it's part of the growing experience in order for these kind of messages and um, ways of examining problems to happen in a, in a safe way in a, in, a, in a metaphor or a, a parable mm. i know that Stephen, you've talked about this previously and maybe not here but kind of acting and playing roles and telling stories and other people's stories has perhaps even saved you a little bit as well kind of say kind of being able to connect kind of with the human experience through different being different people makes you makes it easier for you to be able to connect kind of with the world at large but do you both feel kind of that's the one thing that kind of being an actor the privilege it perhaps gives you as well yeah um but also you know just, just to reiterate what benedict just said 
look, I know a lot of it is entertainment, and don't get me wrong, some of the stuff we do is entertaining massively, hopefully, hopefully. Um, but then occasionally you are allowed to either, you know, some be seen on screen or, or even more appropriately come through that little empathy box that's in the middle of everyone's living room. And if you can mm. penetrate through that, and like yeah. Benedict said, if you can cause some kind of discussion or throw something up for debate, which, which breaks the normal of what may normally happen in that household, or you create a platform for someone to go, mum, do you know what? Or, or dad, I was just, is, can we, if you create that atmosphere, then, then you know, look, to me, that's, that's a gift. That's yeah. a hell of a gift. Mm. And to be able to be in a position where we can put a mirror up to society and say, let's have a look at ourselves here for a second, you know, be, be it in whatever format that may be, um, Let's just take a little look at us for a second and see how we conduct with our fellow man. Do you know what I mean? And and see and see are we are we kind? Are we are we being sincere? Or where are our motives from? I think to be in that position is is a huge privilege and a huge honor for me. Um, just for me in particular. Do you know what I mean? To to be able to to, to go down that road of of being of being an actor, a young, a young lad that wanted to act and getting on a bus. And going to the Everyman Youth Theatres, you know what I mean? For me, that was a wonderful opportunity. Um, and to meet lots of like-minded people, do you know what I mean? That was where I got to meet kids with posh accents, kids who had paper layer and listened to Morrissey, whereas I was just a break dancer who had a nice pair of Adidas trainees. But, you know, that was where we all got to have our place to, to, to come and meet like-minded people and to, to be a part of these stories and, and to take what we've learned there back into our households and, and back into our friendship groups. I, I, for me, it was imperative in, in, in forming the man who I am today. Do you know what I mean? It really was. And hopefully what Benedict, I completely agree with what he was saying with that kind of, it gives us that experience to be able to create this place for our children to, to try and raise the children to the best of our abilities. You know what I mean? But give them a platform to be these round mind, round, rounded, honest, decent, pure individuals, you know what I mean? And and for me, it's integral and it really is. It's I feel so blessed to be able to do what I do. And what Benedict was saying earlier on, you know, throughout the pandemic and stuff like that, the luxury of the job that we do, and, and it's it's not a job, it's a vocation. It, yeah. It's a vocation, it's not a job. I don't dig ditches, do you know what I mean? I don't, I, I'm, I'm not doing, I'm not working on the railroads and, and all of those jobs are, are honorable jobs in their own right. But I'm very blessed and very lucky to be able to do what I do. I feel personally, um, yeah. and to just to just be able to to be to be in things that have a voice, I suppose, or to be able to give people a voice is is a blessed place to be personally as an actor. I agree. No, 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 no. It's true. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> it's I am going to pick one last audience question to end on. I'm going to pick one that it ends on us all on an optimistic note. Um, which film do you always come back to? Um, the one that brings you joy? Very easy for me. Yeah. <laughs> it's a Go on. It's a oh. ah. You're kidding me. No. It's a wonderful life. Wonderful life. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, are you going to say it's a wonderful life? <laughs> <That's exactly laughs> and I've seen it so many times. Sophie said, um, "Oh, it's playing." We were up in Edinburgh um, with her family there, and she was playing at the cinema. But I, but I know, I know it backwards. I can quite. I don't. I know. And I went to see it. Oh my god! I mean, again, lucky us to have that gift of amplification for some of what we do, as well as the thing in the corner of the room, which is equally. I, I admit, you're absolutely right. It's it's a to have something in your home is 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 a really profound way of of experiencing art, but to see that film large uh, for the first time in a cinema was amazing, and it's everything, isn't it? It's like Jimmy Stewart's act; everyone's acting, but Jimmy Stewart's performance in that is just phenomenal, and it doesn't age. It is a masterclass, and yes, it is a very uplifting Capra movie, but it's not it's not sentimental. It doesn't it's not cheap in its in its sentiment at all. Everything's so richly earned in it, and it's just yeah, it's just a very very beautiful story. It just fills my heart with gratitude. <laughs> that film. Yeah, every time. Yeah, no matter what. Yeah. Yeah, it's very true. Oh. Absolutely. Yeah, you that, that's yeah, a p- perfect perfect way to end. Two in um, one. 
Benedict Cumberbatch, Stephen Graham. Um, this has been great. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. Congratulations on your nomination. Well deserved. Um, for the audience at home, if you want to tune in on Saturday, Sunday, the 13th of March, um, Rebel Wilson will be hosting the EE British Academy Film Awards um, on BBC One in the UK at 7 p.m. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, it's been great. Yeah, wishing you all of the best. And I'm yeah. always, Stephen, going to be calling it the Empathy Box from now on. <laughs> the Empathy uh, Box. The empathy I got box. that off Jack Dawn. It's not my own. I got that off Jack <laughs> pretty good um, so good night to... everyone thank you thank you very much right. you, man. lovely to see you thanks